Welcome again to Three Gens Theology. We believe it is, of course, a high priority for every believer to be firmly rooted in their faith in Christ, and we want to come along as an encouragement and a support uh, in your walk of faith. Uh, today, we take a little deeper dive into bibliography, bibliology. <laughs> <laughs> You did that a while ago, and I, <laughs> it, uh, it rubbed off on me. It does. We take a little deeper dive into bibliology. Uh, we had set forth some foundational and high-priority truths about the Scriptures with revelation and authorship and authority, which, uh, of course, are of great importance. Uh, but now we begin to look at how we got from those original writings to the, the book we hold in our hands today or the text we have on our phones as we uh, scroll through those texts today. Uh, and so we're excited about talking about these things with you and discussing them together uh, today. Let's uh, start with prayer. Father, we come before you and uh, we need your uh, wisdom, your discretion, your uh, direction. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we talk about your truth, your word, uh, your holy scripture, that you would help us to communicate clearly that we might be able to communicate in a right way about its trustworthiness, about uh, the honor that we should give it. And the uh, Lord, help us to honor you in the way we go about discussing it. Amen. Thank you for this time in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Those who hear the word canon for the first time in talking about the Bible probably think we're going to be talking about the history of military struggles in, uh, in Scripture. But actually, it has nothing to do with that. Canon is a Greek word that means a rule. And from a very early period in the history of the church, um, the idea of canon had to do with the correct list of those items that make up the scriptures. I thought it would be interesting for us to take a, uh, a quick trip back into the Old Testament before uh, introducing this any further uh, and giving just one illustration from scripture of how the, the Bible disappeared and reappeared in a very uh, amazing way. In uh, 2 Kings chapter 22, in the time of Josiah, Hilkiah the priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan who read it. And then Shaphan went to the king and uh, he said the... Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it in the presence of the king. Now, it could have been a pretty substantial reading period because there's a lot in the law. But when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, Ahiakim the son of Shaphan, Achor the son of Micaiah, Shaphan the scribe, and Isaiah the king's servant, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that burns against us, because our fathers have not listened to the words of this book to do according to all that is written in it. Imagine the scrolls of the books of Moses sitting within the temple for long, long years with no one paying any attention to them. And suddenly the king is confronted with them, tears his clothes and realizes that they are under the judgment of the Lord. How in the house of the Lord in Judah could the scrolls of the book have sat for such a long time without being seen? Uh, obviously, they weren't pulling out this. They were pulling out scrolls and reading them. And when this story begins, it brings to our minds the whole question of just how did all of the scripture that we have here end up here? And that's really what we're looking at today. Mm -hmm. yep. From an early period, this process has been thought of as being kind of a, a deliberation. You know, several people like us sitting around in a room with a lot of scrolls around us saying, no, you've read that scroll. Do you think maybe it belongs in Scripture? Oh, I'm not sure. Uh, why don't you take your scroll and then we'll talk about that one. 
uh, I'm not quite prepared for that. Uh, let's, let's look at your scroll first. And on and on the process would go, and they would finally come to agreement as to which books belonged. This whole idea brings up some really important questions. Was it the action of the men that made the scriptures canonical? Or was it the action of the men merely that of recognizing that these books were scripture? Who met? And when did they decide? Uh, was the decision made by men without divine aid? Or was God involved in the process? Was there no consensus among the users of Scripture before the councils on canonicity met? In other words, did everybody sit around and say, I'm not sure this is Scripture, but on the other hand, what is the basis of the decision as to whether a book was deserving or not to be included in the canon? These are some of the issues that we have to think about today. We'll look at the answers to some of these questions, but let me answer the first one in such a way that it'll be very clear what we believe in regard to the issue of the men who made the decision and the books themselves. The first and foremost point the student must keep in mind concerning the canon of the scriptures, this assemblage of books, that makes up the scriptures, is that the people who took it upon themselves to the task of determining the canon merely recognized that the books of scripture were in fact scripture as they had originally been written. In other words, for these people who gradually made the decisions that these books belonged in the canon, the decision was not based upon their deliberations, but rather their recognition of the fact that God had given these books as Scripture to begin with. Right. Well, even like you're reading in the Old Testament, there was already a canon of Scripture. Uh, it didn't include the prophets or the, uh, the bulk of the poetry at the time of a lot of the Old Testament happening. You know, uh, but there was already a canon happening, yes. and then as more writings happened, the canon grew. But it was recognized as a canon of Scripture. Um, let not this law of the Lord depart from you, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's that's uh, recognizing God's word. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I, J Jesus um, when he would rebuff people would talk about um, that God had said to them, you know, and so he was recognizing what the, what the Hebrews had as their Old Testament, which is what we have as our Old Testament, what they had as their scripture, as the canon mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of the scriptures at the time. And he identified again and again through his quotation of the Old Testament right. these passages and saying the Scripture says that, does not the Scripture say? Right. So it's not like at any certain time was it officially decided that this is the canon. It, it was something that as they were written, the canon grew. Yes. Um, and they were, they were officially a part of it. And even in the early church, they were already recognized as Scripture. Um, it just wasn't in a list somewhere. Right. Or the list that existed, and this is kind of an interesting problem, Dan. Right. The list that existed would vary from list to list in the order the books were put into the right. Hebrew Scriptures, uh, in the uh, arrangement, for example, within the Psalms. It's, uh, it's fascinating as we look at the history of the development of the Psalms that within Hebrew assemblies of Hebrew scriptures, the Psalms would sometimes be in different order. Mm -hmm. that, that order seemed to be finally solidified probably in, uh, in the Old Testament period of time when the last of the books that we find written were written. Right. Um, these differences, though, uh, 
gradually came to the place where they were so ironed out, probably by Ezra and those who were in his time, that by the time we look at, say, the Dead Sea Scrolls, much of those things had already been established. Right. And uh, by, by the time when, when Christ was here, they physically here, they didn't, um, they wouldn't have had the Old Testament, our Old Testament, in the same order necessarily that we have it in. Mm-hmm. Um, they wouldn't have necessarily, um, but they would have had our Old Testament. I mean, it would have been, yes, it would, it is, it is what we recognize as our number of books. They wouldn't have had them as our number of books. They would have grouped the prophets differently. The uh, kings were combined. Kings and were combined. And, and, right. Were combined. The, right. Yeah. So it would have been a lesser number of total books, but it was the same books that we have. And it Even would, if you look at a, a Hebrew Bible today, right. you will find that the order in the Hebrew Bible is different than it is in our uh, Protestant Bibles. Right. But it's the same books. But they're the same books. Right, yeah. So that canon, that canon is really much more settled. Uh, You have the Apocrypha to worry about. Um, I don't think there's that much question on that because the Hebrews settled settled that as what they accepted as the Scripture for the Old Testament. Um, But then you have the New Testament uh, question of what letters, what books, is uh, more of what that questioning uh, becomes, I think. Was one of the things that they tried to do to come up with a uh, solution as to how the Old Testament books were finally solidified into a, a, uh, an organized canon was that the story was told that the rabbis in 90 AD at Jamnia had gathered together for that purpose and that they came up with the final arrangement uh, of the Hebrew scriptures as they are now printed today. Mm-hmm. There's no real evidence that that gathering ever took place. But it, if we do recognize the fact that the scriptures were recognized by the users as being God's word, then it's, no dif- it's not difficult for us to go right. past that non-historic historic event and see how they were there you, you were saying you're saying there's not evidence we're not seeing historical evidence of that taking place but that is the hebrew tradition that that took place and that's why we see value in that correct yes that's correct yeah. the, sto- the story is is a tradition as there are many traditions within uh hebrew writings that uh, that help us to see background uh, various ways of looking at things even the the two categories of pseudepigrapha and apocryphal books uh, are firmly decided. The pseudepigrapha being books that are written uh, supposedly by a specific biblical character uh, that were not actually written by that character and they're not real biblical books. It's interesting that Eusebius, the early church historian, in his account of the history of the early church, includes chapters where he mentions what uh, various of the church fathers had believed concerning what were and were not the biblical books. And he even mentions in one chapter, chapter 25 of the book, that there, are, there were some books at that time that they knew of, a Gospel of Thomas, for example, um, a Gospel of Peter, that were not recognized as being scripture. They were stories, they were interesting stories, but they did not have the quality of scripture, and this mm-hmm. was recognized by the church right. in general. So that same process of uh, what happened for the Old Testament over hundreds of years um, happened in the New Testament over uh, ten, tens of years, decades, <laughs> where as they were written, they were recognized by the church yes. as as scripture. Right. And we see that within the New Testament as as Peter references Paul's writings mm-hmm. as scripture, right? Right. Uh, so uh, you have you have a bit of that within the text itself. Um, but then the ch- the early church recognized um, different books as scripture along the way. It just wasn't recorded and kept for us 
along that way, mm-hmm. right? And it was uh, fragmentally um, uh, kept, but not not uh, conclusively. And so that's where the councils come in. Is that's that's what the councils end up doing is recognizing, yes. as you said, recognizing what had already been established. Um, so it's not that those councils decided things, but those councils recognized what was already true. Is yes. that a good way of putting that? That's a good way of putting yeah. it. The, the councils of the early church that did finally approve what the canon would be were again, as you said, approving what God had already demonstrated about those books, that they had a character about them, that they had a usability, that they had a history, all of which contributed to their being accepted as Scripture. But the acceptance as Scripture was merely a recognition. It's sort of like uh, the way we describe ordination, in which there's the laying on the hands of people in the church, the the deacons usually in the church, on this individual who has been examined, who's answered questions, who has submitted a doctrinal statement. All of this is done, but when the final message is given, the understanding is that what what we're doing is recognizing what God has already done. Mm -hmm. And that is that God has called this individual right. into the ministry. Right. In a similar way, it's a recognizing of what God has always already done that brought the canon into its final shape. In my excitement to start talking about it, I think I jumped throughout some of your questions. So uh, do I think we might need to uh, possibly jump back to some of the particular questions. Well, even as you as you find your spot, I've always liked the. Uh, even the how we got the word canon and that grandpa you re- referenced that it was a ruler mm-hmm. um, but even uh, we see that used uh, one of the areas that we see this that idea come from is in Egypt as they measured the Nile or as they or as different people measured rivers they would have a set stick they'd have a mm-hmm. set measurement and they'd stick that down when there'd be high tides and they'd see how you know how high the river was and it was all to see what measured up Right. right, and so as we see Scripture, it's we're seeing what what measures up to God's word, and so uh, even I mean, it literally was a ruler, and that's yeah. how we got the word canon. It wasn't because it was a you know because the Bible two edged sword you know blows holes through you or anything, but <laughs> no. you know, it's, a, it's a ruler that that says what measures up. That's right. I heard I heard I think it was White that talked about it that uh, canon with two ends goes boom boom for two two ends. <laughs> Uh, this, this canon has one end. Canon with two ends is boom, boom. I thought that was pretty funny. One of the, the questions theolo- that I asked, Theologians are dorks. Theologians can be dorks. Yes, yes I, dorks. you know, and I That's do right. apologize if we come across that way. But one of the questions that, that's important for us to answer is, is one that's going to require uh, our thinking both here in the canon and also as we talk about the pre- preservation of Scripture. Um did God simply leave that process, leave that process in the hands of uh, uninformed people, or was God the Holy Spirit actually involved in the process? And I think it should be unanimously acclaimed that God the Holy Spirit, the author of Scripture, would not have left this particular phase of the development of the Scriptures as we have them up to just anyone. This was a This was the leading of the Holy Spirit in the minds and hearts of the users of the books that make up the scriptures Mm -hmm. that brought men to a recognition that this is God's word. Right. Yeah. Um, I think there's a, I think it's undeniable that the Spirit continues to preserve his word and that that is the case. I'm, I find myself in that discussion um, concerned with the uh, overuse of that, that then God superintended a special translation of mm-hmm. some kind that, well, then why do we have, which we're going to get to, yes. tr- you know, co- copies that, that differ. 
why wouldn't why wouldn't the Holy Spirit have pristine copies? Mm -hmm. You know, and right. so um, there's there's um, it's it's um, it's not the same. I, I don't think it's the same as the authors being moved along to write exactly what God wanted. Um, but it, it does flow along with the sovereignty of God establishing m the correct books to be recognized uh, with, um, with the canon, the, the listing. Right. Uh, you know, um, so I do think sometimes that thought of, well, if, if God's going to be involved, shouldn't it all just be with the light shining behind it and everything completely perfect and no, no, you know, uh, no questions at all? Because then when anybody looks at it and sees that there are copies with differences and any questions at all, then they begin to question everything mm -hmm. and there's no need to do that. So I, I think that we don't want to step away from the idea that there was a Holy Spirit direction in recognizing which books truly are right uh, the scripture. Um, but I think we want to be careful in how far we push that, I guess. I, I, I'm concerned about that. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, my thought on that, Dan, basically is we recognize that the scriptures were God-breathed. Right. They were inspired. They were uh, inerrant as they were first written. They mm -hmm. were given directly by God to provide us with his word. But they were committed to human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, the very fact that we as preachers and teachers of the word utilize the word of God in our humanity with, with a recognition that God the Holy Spirit, as the word is preached, uses the word in the hearts and minds of the people who are listening. And, and uh, certainly enables you to be able to proclaim the word with power, you're still a human being. That's for sure. And, and can make mistakes. The, the same process is involved in this issue because we find that although God the Holy Spirit continued to put his stamp of approval, if you will, on the words that, that are in the books, that are in the scriptures, the canon was made up uh, by recognition of what the Holy Spirit had already done mm -hmm. in the God-breathedness of these books to begin with. Right. But he certainly was involved as well in helping godly men to be able to utilize the word in such a way that both the historical tradition and the value and quality of the books themselves were combined to make them absolutely positive that these are in fact scripture. Right. Yeah. So the the dates the dates of things. Um, uh, the councils of Hippo and Carthage. Hippo in 393, Carthage in 397 and 419. Those are uh, you know nearly um, 300 years after the last book was written. Mm -hmm. But there's a reason for that that. Basically, Christianity was underground mo almost all that time. Right. So there, there weren't, there weren't uh, public meetings where you could proclaim things, but there were. Um, I think it was 167. Is that when it was the the fragmented list mm -hmm. um, that we have that has almost all of the New Testament books in the in the fragmented list. Right. Um, and so much earlier than these councils of 393 and 397 are, are uh, listings of, of New Testament books that we, that that we would that right, that we would that we would recognize. Right. So the councils of Hippo and Carthage um, are um, by, by our date still early, mm -hmm. but they're not by a, by a cynical mind. 400, you know, the year 400 is still quite a ways from when they're writing. Right. But the, the reason is because they, they were, it, the church was underground. I mean, it was in persecution almost all that time. So right. they, they, it's not like 
it's not like they were going to have a big gathering and and say, hey, hey, here we're going to have a big gathering. Come kill us. You know, they weren't having they weren't having, uh, um, you know, big conferences that where they were going to meet for those things. Sure. So um, I think there's good reason for that delay for the formalness of it. Right. Right. Um, but and, those lists are still there. And even to recognize that like that, it wasn't like the Bible didn't exist until those times. That's they exactly certainly right. had tons of writings yep. and a lot of them being scripture. They, they've had, they would have had other things. And, um, you know, in these, that there's, there's a reason they picked what they did and didn't pick what they, what mm-hmm. they didn't pick. I mean, that right. was the Holy spirit. Um, right. but they, they understood, you know, even the church would have had an idea of, you know, that these books are special uh, in, in how they read. So it's not like they were Bible lists for 400 years. They still had those writings. Yeah, yeah. we find Paul asking uh, uh, Mark to be sent with the, uh, the books and the parchments mm-hmm. to him. Mm-hmm. And that, that makes me think, Sai, as, as I look at that period of time, um, how incredible it was that this this wonderfully increasing New Testament, uh, this amazing gradually uh, forming document was being carried around by individuals through the early church moving from one place to another. It was stored underground. It was kept in, uh, in churches until these things were read to rags. All of this was, was a dynamic period of growth Mm-hmm. that finally didn't reach the place where open meetings like those that you're describing could take place right. until after it began to reach the place that the Roman Empire became involved in this. Christianity became more acceptable, and as it was more acceptable, it was easier for them to meet right. and go over this. You, you read uh, uh, like uh, Brown's Da Vinci Code. He gives you the impression through one of the characters that he has there that it really wasn't until this time that they all sat down and said, okay, let's put all this stuff together and make mm-hmm. scripture. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, he is totally wrong in that. That is not how it worked. Scripture was recognized long before that. These councils merely recognize what had already been understood for hundreds of years. Mm-hmm. And even the there were, in, at these councils, there were arguments about would this book be in? Would that book not be in? But um, not not our not our present day political hagglings. Of I'll give you a I'll give you a First Timothy if you give me a you know Second what I mean Peter. right Second Peter. Um, there was a there was a a much more needing of a unanimous vote um, for for the books to be in. Yes, um, it wasn't um, um, you know. It, it, it wasn't a, a conniving to get the books right. in. It wasn't that way. Uh, it had to be recognized at the rule, at the, at the measure. It, yes. had, it had to meet the standard. Uh, so some of that standard, um, and, I think we might yeah. get to. But I think that the, the, one of the questions that that brings up is if they were still debating over whether this particular book was, in fact, authoritative, was scripture or not, It was because there had been a number of authors who up to that point had been challenging based upon their own background, their own Marcion is a good example of that, who came from a very strange position. Uh, He was more Gnostic in many ways. And by the way, this goes into another debate that takes place as to whether in the early church There was a warfare that took place between those who won and got the scriptures their way and those who lost and had all those Gnostic books that are out there that are still floating to the surface. We're still finding, have been translated hundreds and hundreds of years later. Um, the, The truth of the matter is there were very few books left that were even under debate, and much of that debate was based upon uh, the arguments of individuals who had an axe to grind and wanted to try to get uh, certain books removed and other books put in. Now, G- Grandpa, was Marcy in a childhood friend of yours, or was that? Uh... <laughs> I did know a Marcy, but I had no Marcy in oh, his yeah. life. You weren't you weren't around back yeah, then. No, okay. no, and no Martians either. Oh, I want you to. There know you that. Go. So, so we don't. So we want to be clear. We're not saying that the the 
the criteria that was used as the 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 man-made attempts to verify the standard mm -hmm. are not what makes something scripture it was already scripture and what the what the standards are trying to recognize yes. are trying to see if it meets meets uh, a standard that's right. already there and so it's not that that these standards are are as you were rubbing your chin deciding whether or not this should be or shouldn't be but rather it already is yes and it should be clearly seen as you consider a few standards that it is or it falls right you know it is or it falls and so let's talk through some of those uh, standards that they used one of them is the idea of an, uh, an apostle's connection mm -hmm. um, in the old testament you had a, a prophet's connection right and in the new testament an apostle's connection and so it needed to have some connection to a, an apostle's writing so you would have uh, mark that was written that isn't an apostle uh, but mm -hmm. connected to, uh, we believe, Peter, right. right? So it would be thought of connected to an apostle there, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that kind of thing. Anything else that you want to say about well, that, that? Remember, one? too, that there are very strict standards in Scripture for how any prophecy, for example, is to right. be accepted. Yeah. If you look at the Old Testament, uh, a, a prophet could be examined by whether his prophecies were true or not. If there was something that was, uh, was falsely said, I, I remember the prophecies in uh, Jeremiah where the people in Babylon, the prophets in Babylon who were false prophets, were telling the people that within two or three years they would be back in Palestine, back in their home. The Lord had to send a letter through Jeremiah to the people to say, don't listen to these prophets. It is going to be 70 years, one generation, before anyone goes back to their home in mm -hmm. Jerusalem. That's the kind of false prophecy that was unacceptable. And any prophet who spoke that way, who had written anything, that writing would not be acceptable either. Right. Um, so the tests of the apostles having individuals with them, the, the constant reference to the fact that this write, writing is associated with this particular apostle absolutely did the same thing in the New Testament that was accomplished in the Old Testament by these rules about recognition. Right. right, right. Okay. Uh, internal evidence. Now, this actually helps the Old Testament more than it helps the New Testament just because of the way this sets up. But right. you have especially uh, th books referencing other books, mm -hmm. writers referencing other writers that give credence to right. them, right? Uh, and especially when you have Christ, Christ, Christ quoting Old Testament. It's pretty well, when he Many says, times. the Lord says, and then he quotes something, <laughs> it's pretty you know, foundational that that's then scripture. Right. Um, so you, you have several of those. You do have what we've talked about already in Second Peter, where uh, Peter refers to Paul's writings as, as scripture. Now, that, that doesn't mean everything Paul ever wrote was scripture, but, he, you know, he's referring to Paul's uh, letters uh, there as something that is elevated to a scriptural level. Um, and so you do have those internal evidences within the scripture. Yes. Anything else you want to... Uh, recognition uh, also comes through the realization that uh, a reference back to things that are said by the Lord Jesus that are referred to as the scriptures say and it's Jesus being quoted. We actually have situations right. like that in the New Testament. Right. So that then ver verifies that the Gospels uh, right. are in fact yep. scripture. So we move through all of these references, and there are many, many of them in the New and Old Testaments, where books, ref where writers of one particular book refers to the writers of another, or participants in the development yeah. of yeah. another, yeah. and so those become internal evidences for us yeah. of these books being scripture. I like how um, uh, I think it's White that brings out that uh, uh, Jesus, when he's talking to someone, says, "Have you not read?" 
mm-hmm. when God uh, and heard God say, or you know, anyway, he uses the two words "read" and "say." Yes, and it, they don't go together. It, it, we read through it, and it doesn't make we don't even pick it up because it's it's normal to us as we read it. Right. But when you say "read" and I have written, right, and right. or said and heard. But the way Jesus says it, he's, have you not read and God said? Yes. Um, and it's because the scriptures are really what God is saying to you. And Jesus was very careful in his teaching to distinguish between the add-on material and the spirit of the scriptures as they were originally given. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have heard that. Right. But I say that, and then he's referring back to the teachings of the Old Testament, revising their thinking in that during the period of time from Ezra all the way up until the time of the Lord Jesus, much law had been added Added, that was not found in the Old Testament law. Right, so they took the scriptures, and then they had their own writings. Mm -hmm. And what Jesus is doing is he's saying your own writings are not... They're not scripture. You've yes. heard it said this. You've heard it taught this. Right. But uh, but what I'm saying is, the scriptures are actually uh, saying something different. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, even on the internal evidence, even the the flip side of we see Jesus referring to Old Testament, uh, but also the the prophecy about Jesus that is fulfilled by Jesus would mm-hmm. give credence to those prophetic books yes uh, that, that that flip side works as well right yeah mm-hmm. um, orthodoxy and antiquity um, this would just be that the Old Testament uh, is recognized by the Hebrews by the Jewish people as the as the right Old Testament right right um, and uh, that it's recognized as as the right one so uh, back there and then, they already had that canon set. Right. You know. Yes. Yeah. It's important too to re- remember that our language can always become confusing in these areas. For example, um, we will often say in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, but why do we use that terminology? Well, it's because it's a terminology that developed early within the church that recognized the fact that there was a covenant that was made by God, many covenants in the Old Testament that we'll talk about later on, Um, and that that Old Testament, particularly referring in that case to the writings of Moses, is contrasted to the New Covenant, which we have in Christ Jesus. And so the Old Covenant and the New Covenant became translated Old Testament and New Testament, whereas the Hebrews would not have used that kind of terminology. And when we say that, what we are doing is making that distinction. The New Testament is made up of books that have been written relating to Jesus' ministry before he established the New Covenant. Right. Well, as you read in the book of Hebrews, you see that contrast over and over again of the old system and the new system and yes. so it's it's related to that mm-hmm. right that right. that difference right okay um we are uh, we're at time on on this we were we're going to be able to wrap up canon i think uh today um the use of um um right evidence to limit the canon, but not in a way that um, just arbitrarily shuts out other writings. Right. Um, so um, I think earlier, just earlier, you said that the, there were early writers that, like Eusebius, that that were accusatory of other books, and so that's why they didn't make it into the canon at the Marcia. at the councils. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's true, and and I think, but they were discussed at those councils. They were discussed, right. and I think it's important for us to recognize that there are plenty of writings in that are related to Old Testament, uh, 
and New Testament books in that the names of the individuals uh, or the stories or the descriptions or even the, the content that was written about that Old Testament character, that Old Testament book, that New Testament character or book, sometimes they were very popular. Sometimes they were hardly known. Uh, a few of the popular ones we find in the Apocrypha, in some versions of the Old Testament that are accepted by the Roman Catholic Church, for example. Uh, a writing called the Didache that was written uh, as a very famous, very popular book. The Shepherd of Hermes was a very popular book read during the early church. All of those writings, though beautiful and memorable and interesting, were recognized as not being scripture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the number of books that we have today that we call the canon of scripture, it's not, we've come to call it the canon, which ends up being a list of approved books. Yes. But that's not really what canon means. Canon means a rule or a measure that it, it stacks up to this mm -hmm. authority, this, uh, um, this, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Specialness. I don't know, this uh, rule, um, as the word canon rule. Um, but it, it's come to mean that it, that it makes the list, that it officially is on the list of approved books, right? Yes. Um, and we are settled. Um, we're settled with this list. Yes. We're, we're not, uh, we don't need to, um, we don't mind the discussion. We know that there's councils where men were involved in discussing it, and that doesn't scare us, mm -hmm. right? Right. Um, and so as believers find out about these um, lists that were made up at 160 years or 393 or 397, you know, the year, year th those years, um, it's not like we didn't have a canon before that. Right. Um, and so uh, I think sometimes as, as young believers or even sometimes older, you know, more mature believers are ignorant of a canon idea and then find out about these things, sometimes they get a little bit jarred by the fact that people were involved in that. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason to be shaken no. uh, by that uh, because it was recognized as they were written. It was recognized by the early church, especially in the New Testament, by the early church. That that's scripture, and that's scripture, and that's scripture. And that's why those were copied and passed around and, and uh, shared and, right. and, um, and held as special by the early church. And so we don't need to be uh, afraid of those things. Right. Absolutely. So uh, as we think about uh, today, um, in the last, I guess, in my mind, the last 10-ish years, it's become popular to have like a, uh, a timeline Bible and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, do, we, do we see, uh, as we talk about men putting together this, is there, you know, I, th I think sometimes we get the heebie-jeebies that people – you know, moving books around, it, 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 is, right. is that a problem that if, uh, you know, if they switched Matthew and Luke for some time, right. I don't know why they do that, but would that be an issue? Oh, I, go, go ahead. ahead. You're right. Go ahead. All right. The chronological Bibles are, are basically, as you said, a rearranging of the books in what appears to be a proper historical order. Uh, I, I would say I have no problem with them in that there no good chronological Bible will ever leave out any portion of the scriptures right. nor add in anything that does not belong there. They've simply been moved to different locations to make it easier to sort of follow the development. But we always have to remember that there are going to be differences even among experienced Bible scholars as to the exact timing of the introduction of any one of those books or the, the historical sequence of those books. There might be a difference in, uh, in when they recognize them, one before or after another. Right. right. And the Hebrew Bible would be in a different order than our Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And right. it, it doesn't make it less correct, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, the order um, would matter. And I think um, some of the chronological Bibles would, would take Psalms and put them with historical yeah. things. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I like that 
that's that's a little there's some guessing involved there mm-hmm. because you don't know that those psalms are necessarily with those historical things some of them you can know pretty well and some of them you don't really know and so yeah. you're, they're you're, they're guessing uh, on the placement of those, um, which is a which it's still a good psalm. It's still a good writing, you know. But you don't really know that it fits there. So um, for them to take that psalm and place it in that setting that doesn't necessarily fit chronologically. But it's not it's not wrong. Right. You know what I mean? I just think you want to be careful about the Psalms, especially in that chronological right. setting. Right. Uh, there are some Psalms who are, that are very clearly right. pulled out of a specific historical context yep. and putting it back into that context is no problem. Right. There are just other Psalms that don't have a context that can, that is clearly given right. in the Psalm. And Correct. For those, they would be sort of a guess. Yep. So lastly, Dad, you referenced white a couple times during this. Why don't you say who that yeah, is? That yeah. way if our listeners want to so do a J- little extra study. James, James White and Mike Michael Kruger, I think, are two, uh, two um, common um, speakers, writers, that, uh, that would be, I think, close to agreement on mm-hmm. us with uh, having the scriptures be uh, canonized progressively as they were written, and that that's an important recognition that it wasn't a council that recognized it, that that decided it, but that they were written, they were, the canon grew as it was written. I think that's a really important recognition. Right. Uh, I think Beck, Beckwith would be in mm-hmm. that setting too. Um, what's his first name? Roger. Roger. And he's, he's probably more academic. Um, if you'd like to dig into a more academic setting, I think that's probably accurate. Right. Um, probably deeper. Um, I don't, I don't think White or Kruger would despise me saying that. <laughs> they're, they're all more academic than I am, um, but uh, all of them are good. Um, are good, and, and I don't know that I would agree with all three of. I don't know where they all stand uh, in all of their doctrine, uh, but uh, on this, I think I would find agreement with them on the uh, canon, canonization of scripture. And if I might end on this note. These authors may disagree with each other in various places. Scholars do that. Mm -hmm. Um, There's one basic reason that we do, and that is that nobody was there. Right. Oh, wait a minute. The Holy Spirit was. Right, the whole time. Hmm. Could that have something to do with why we have the Scriptures in the right place? Could be. I'm sure it is. <laughs> are there any other? Uh, I mean, I, I know, there's a plethora of authors about this, but are there any that that you? Uh, F. F. Bruce would be right, another possibility. Right. Yep. Um, there are some very lengthy books that have been written on canon. Uh, the main thing that we have to be careful of, and and by the way, we're going to get into this in this next podcast, so I won't get into detail on it. But it's important to recognize the fact that. As we investigate issues related to the canon, we find that the amount of historical information begins to build, uh, and we find more about the people who were involved in those discussions. But we also find that, surprisingly, even people whom you would expect would oppose the idea that God directly put together this book will agree that books are canonical and not canonical uh, along with us Mm -hmm. for a variety of the same reasons. Right, right. Well, thank you so much for uh, listening and taking part with us. You can uh, hear us on all the podcast outlets and watch us on YouTube. And please um, comment and uh, give us reviews as you can. And um, I think there's a, a way to review on Apple Podcasts. We'd love for you to do that so that we can uh, get those inputs there. If you want to email us, uh, my email is pd at crossbridgeindy.com. That's Pastor Dan, pd at crossbridgeindy.com. And we post these podcasts every Monday morning. What we have with us is a cohesive uh, set of writings that the Lord desired for us to have that tells of his story from in the beginning through the offering of his son, all the way to his return and our reign with him, and uh, we can be confident in it. So uh, we will uh, 
see you next time. Until then, uh, take in his word and uh, be, have it be a trustworthy uh, source of truth in your life.